Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. I'm super excited to have Creighton Lowe here. And um, Creighton, I've followed you for a while. Um, I oh. know your mentors, your b- past business partners really well. Yeah. And yeah, uh, we know a lot of the same people. We have a lot of really good sure. mutual friends. So I'm really excited to have you on. We're going to talk real estate. We're going to talk personal, talk being a dad. Cool. And really about your journey in life. And, and there's a few things that I'm excited to talk to you about. But First of all, just tell us a little bit about what you're about. You've got two little kids, yeah. wife, you're in real estate. Yeah. What have you got going on? Yeah, eight chickens, four bunnies. I think we're getting horses. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah, we're living the dream. And you live in one of the most beautiful places in Utah. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's really pretty. Yeah, we pulled the trigger about three years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in Alaska. A lot of my family is from Utah, so it was really natural to come back here for college. Went to the University of Utah. Um, stayed here, got into real estate during college, and uh, worked for a while met my wife and uh, we lived here in Olympus Cove for a little bit is mm-hmm. where we were first married, moved in together, had kids, got a couple dogs, did a big remodel. And then during COVID, um, we would, we, we, we kind of always had the idea that Olympus Cove was a bit more of me mm-hmm. and a little bit less of her. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up in that area. I loved being in the mountains. I could walk out the front door and be on the trails with the dogs and the Z trail and Neff's Canyon and off leash and just the life I really loved. Yeah, you're, I mean, of, you're right at the base of the mountains. Oh, there, it's right, right there, yeah. And we sit on the front yard. We remodeled our front yard. We remodeled the whole house, but we remodeled our front yard. We had these patio chairs out front. We could sit outside with a cocktail and look up at Mount Olympus and just all of its glory at night and Medusa's face and Neff's Canyon. It was gorgeous. For our non-Utah listeners, that's Salt Lake. I mean, describe yeah. describe the mountains right there, I mean, and where you're at. You're, you're just south of Salt Lake, right? Yeah, so it's kind of like it's halfway just south of the entrance of Parlor's Canyon, which takes out to Park City. So you have kind of Salt Lake over here, and you're still Salt Lake Metropolis, but you're very East Bench. And the cool thing about Salt Lake that so many people come from out of town is like the mountains are like right there, you know. Even in Denver, which is on the you know on the front over the other side, the mountains are kind of off on a distance. After some rolling hills, you're three and a half hours to Vail on I seventy. Whereas here, I mean, they're just they're well, right there. Olympus Cove is like twenty minutes from four ski resorts, and then another thirty five minutes to Park City and another three yeah. ski resort. I mean, yeah, you're really kind of central, crazy close, like at the foot of the mountains, yeah. beautiful views. But yeah. now you're in Heber, or is it yeah. Midway? No, we're in Heber. Yeah, we went to East Heber, and we went to very specific targeted spot. So. We were sitting there during COVID and we had a new baby boy, little Brooks. He was mm-hmm. born. Um, he was like three years old and we were pregnant with our second one and we would watch our street and our street was dead silent. I mean, mm-hmm. dead quiet, right? In fact, my son's, my little three-year-old boy, his favorite friend on the street was this 90-year-old man named Bob who <laughs> <laughs> would like, we're like walk up and down the street in his walker on a daily basis because Olympus Cove is a lot of up and down on the hillside. Yeah. And a lot of people would walk on our street because it was one of the only horizontal flat streets. And Bob would come by with his walker and sit down and talk to Brooks, which was great and fun. But like my wife grew up in a cul-de-sac with yeah. you know 10 kids per house and they'd all play in the cul-de-sac. I grew up in Alaska where it was like freedom to range and we had friends in the back what door. part of Alaska, by the way? Anchorage. Okay, cool. Yeah, nothing super glorious. My dad was in oil, so that's know, awesome. Anchorage. I go. I've been like five times. Okay, love, cool. love the Kenai Peninsula. Did you go in July or August? I've been in both. I've been in July, yeah. August, and September. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah. Big, most people who love it went in July or August. Yeah, yeah. Try going in like April. No, no, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's still way too cold. It's a different story. Anyways, so we looked at our life and said, "Is this really where we can see ourselves long term? Mm-hmm. A relatively advanced, not geriatric, but in a." A, it's an age gap, right? A, 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 however you want to say it. But we looked at our life and said, oh, we just don't see ourselves forever here. Mm-hmm. One car garage and a carport, no room for a boat, no room for an RV, a trailer, a little bit more room to breathe. So we said, okay, let's, if we're going to leave Olympus Cove, where are we going to go? Yeah. And so we started looking a lot at Lake Draper to get some land and maybe Corner Canyon was a huge draw for mountain biking because both mm-hmm. my wife and I are big mountain bikers. And we also talked a lot about Harriman. Yeah. And we thought about going out to Harriman and, you know, some more space and young, vibrant community and a lot of up and coming. A lot of our friends are out there. A lot of her friends are out there. But I just, A, she didn't want to be a Draper mom. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and B, I didn't want to go out to Harriman. I didn't want to drive. I didn't want to commute. A lot of my databases up here on the East Bench. And I was selling more and more real estate up in Heber and Midway and Timberlakes and Park City and the Wasatch Back. And we'd go up to Deer Creek to go boating. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, we'd go to Dairy King. And then we'd go, you know, up to the Center Creek or we'd go up to Timberlakes and go to a cabin or we'd go up to Daniel's Strawberry Reservoir. And I kept on being like, what if? Yeah. And like, 
why not Heber? Like, yeah. What if? And we always, she's a country girl. She's a cowboy. I'm a cowboy. And I grew up around horses. We talked about maybe having animals. So we started driving around Heber and we identified one specific neighborhood that we said, okay, if we're going to do this, let's do it once and let's do it right. And there's a neighborhood called Triple Crown. It's just outside the city. So you're in county technically, which is one acre lots minimum, R140. Okay. Nice. So everything's one acre around us and it's a subdivision. So it's still a community. Mm-hmm. but it's spread out enough. And the elementary school is like 200 yards this way. The junior high is 150 yards this way. The high school is like a quarter mile that way. Wow. Like out our back door, we can watch our son, watch the school. And we identified that neighborhood. And we said, it's it's triple crown or bust for wow. us. Because you got red ledges up here and then you yeah. got center street and 12th South over here and everything's growing. And we're like in the uprights of Heber. Yeah. Where all the development's going around us and we're established with one acre lots. And we really love that community, but breathability room. I love that. So, so it works well. That, and you did that in 2020? We did that in 2020, which worked out August of 2020. No, August of 2021. Okay. Yeah, 2021, August of 2021. So COVID had already hit. Mm-hmm. We had been in COVID. My wife went to the elementary school, walked the kids to school, and a lot of the women were like looking at with no mask. And, you know, and anyways, <laughs> so we were just like, let's get out of Salt Lake and let's go somewhere a little bit more country. Yeah, that's funny you did that because I was – so close to pulling the trigger yeah. in Timberlakes. Yeah. I was so close. Going to yeah. sell my house in Lehigh, cool. get up there to the mountains. Yeah. Um, we love, we, I mean, we have razors, four yeah. wheelers, yeah. dirt bikes, Yeah, uh, love animals. Yep. And I was so close to doing that and we didn't. Yeah. Um, then we got divorced. I'm glad we didn't. Got it. Because she would have got the nice Timberlakes house. <laughs> <laughs> Timberlakes is isolated. I mean, it's it it's is. a community now, but it's it's a whole nother it is. level up there. The night I can be there in five minutes, but we're still attached to the city. Yeah, we can walk I love to where parks you're at. And, That's awesome. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. Very cool. Well, for our listeners that don't know you, um, you've been in real estate 20 years? Close yeah, 20. yeah, a little over. Yeah, 21, 22 years. 22 years, yeah. right out of college. In college. In college. Yeah. I yeah, did that as well. Bought my first flip, then I got yeah. my, for my real estate license. Cool. Um, so really, the purpose of the podcast, and we really have moved from real estate focused to leveraging life and and being a great dad, being a great partner, being a great uh, business person, yeah. growing personally, um, overcoming challenges. So before we talked, I said, hey, you know, can you think of something that would help our listeners? Sure. And I wasn't expecting this. And I'm surprised every time I ask that question because um, I told you a week ago, we had a, a, a lady in here who's extremely successful, great mom, yeah. great business person. And she was addicted to meth at age 12. And sure. I was not expecting that. And, and it just... You know, what I found over and over again is people struggle all the time with stuff that you just don't yeah. talk about. And yeah. one thing you and I were just talking about offhand is that, you know, suicide is is really yeah. kind of taboo for yeah. a lot of people. And and it's really bad to not talk about because you have to work through those feelings. Sure. And my dad's a psychologist and he deals with that all the time. And divorce is the same way. I got divorced in 2020 and I had to talk about it a ton. And yeah. and that's the best advice I got. He said, Sam. You're going to have to talk about it over and over yeah. until you get it out yeah. and it becomes a healthy, you have a healthy view of what happened. Yeah. There's so much hurt and anger and frustration. And um, that was the best advice I ever got. Cool. And so it's interesting you said that as well, because coming from a PhD psychologist, that's his best advice. Talk about it with everyone that'll listen, get it out, get it out there and don't trap it inside. And yeah. so you mentioned the story, how your dad had committed suicide yeah. and um, first of all, so sorry. That's so sad and, and rough. Um, that's really, really tough to deal with. Um, my mom actually died in my arms a wow. year ago. I revived her, wow. um, with Narcan. She actually overdosed wow. accidentally on her pain pill. She's yeah. in a car accident. Um, I can't imagine having something, you know, actually having a parent die and in such a traumatic way. Um, that was traumatic enough, you know, having that happen. So tell me a little bit and, 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 not a little bit. Tell me as much as you want about that experience sure. and how it's affected you over the last uh, your life. Um, and and now that you're a dad, how you view that and and how it's helped you become a better dad and better person. Well, you definitely don't like miss a night of tucking them in bed. Yeah, I, mean, I don't care what time I get home. I'm going up and giving them a kiss good night. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I don't care how tired I am. I don't I care love if that. it's two in the morning. If I hear her crying for me. And she's in bed. I will go curl up her in bed because I'm not going to miss a moment of that. I love that. You know what's yeah. interesting is I told you I was going to be late uh, getting here. Yeah. We planned two thirty. 
I was putting out a fire on a property and I looked at my watch. I finished the call a little bit early and today's my ex's day with the kids. We had 50, 50 custody, yeah. but I was like, you know what? I've got time. And I went to the school as they're getting out of school, just to give them a hug. Yeah. 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 And it's not my day with them. And, you know, I was just like, you know what? I've got an extra five minutes parked at the school, ran up to the line before their mom picked them up, gave yeah. them big hugs, tell them I love them. And then I got here. So I love that you say that cool. because, um, for me, it makes a big difference. And I hope for my kids as well, they know that their dad cares. And, um, anyways, I hope it makes a big difference and I'm sure your kids yeah. feel the same. I um, hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. I think looking back in 20 years, you'll be really glad you had that mindset rather so. than, you know, I have a business partner actually that has a lot of regrets as a dad. Sure. And, um, that was about five years. He told me, he's like, you know, I never really took him camping, never put him to bed. Really. He's like, I really wish I had. Yeah. So anyways, yeah. sorry, I cut you off. No, you're but, good. But no, you're that, that kind of hits home for me a lot. Some, somebody mentioned something to me, or maybe I saw it on Instagram. I don't know, but they mentioned the first three minutes in the morning when they wake up and the last three minutes before they go to bed are the most critical moments for you and your relationship with them. Wow. So, like I, if, if I hear that, if I'm up, cause I'm, I'm always, <laughs> almost always up Yeah, way before everybody else in my house. Except for my wife, who I give credit to, who usually hits the gym at 6 a.m. And oh, nice. sometimes I'm at home while the kids are waking up. Anyways, when I hear my little daughter at the top of the stairs. She's I make, three right now, right? She's three, yeah. yeah. So, And we have our primary bedroom on the main level and then their kids' bedrooms upstairs. If I have the opportunity to be the first face she sees in the morning, I will make that grin as awesome. loud as I can and my arms as wide open as I can. I want that to be her image. I want her image to be of dad. When she thinks of dad, I want her to see a huge smile on my face happy, and open arms. I love that. And I'll, and I'll wait for her at the bottom of the stairs and just stare up at her. And then, you know, she'll usually make me come get her and piggyback her down or whatever. That's awesome. But that to me is the first thing that they need to see in the morning is a big smile and open arms. And the last thing they need to hear at night is that I love you. I'm proud of you. And I will always be here for you. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I read a parenting book that um, when you say smile, um, the psychology of the faces you make at your kids is extremely important. I'll bet. Um, before they even understand language and before, even when they do understand language, she's three, she speaks just fine. Um, but they read your face yeah, in yeah. a huge way. Yeah. And um, so I focus since my kids were little babies to always smile at them, just yeah. like you said. And, yeah. And the psychologist goes on to talks about that. That actually forms, helps them for their opinion of themselves. If you're happy to see them, they, they love themselves more. And I was like, holy cow, okay, I got to focus on. And, and just like yelling at your kids is so detrimental. Oh man. Um, but it's funny you say that because I, I wake my six-year-old up. He's almost seven. He loves to hot tub. And we literally hot tub every morning. Oh, cool. Like we get up yeah. a, a half hour earlier than everyone else. Or I actually, I'll get home from the gym. I'll wake him up, uh -huh. piggyback him down to the hot tub and we'll hot tub for 15 Morning minutes. hot tub. Morning hot tub. He just loves it. We're, just, we're a nightcap. Yeah. I <laughs> that's mean, a, that's I our, that's our bath too. time is let's go to the hot tub. Yeah. Oh, if, sometimes if, we do both. <laughs> okay, cool. He freaking uh, loves the hot tub. Nice. So, um, and then my daughter, I and mean, we do bedtime stories. I actually have... Um, we we do bedtime stories every single, single night. They love the Viking stories. We're sure. Vikings, and and I sing them a song. And and so, um, you know, every time I have a, a pod a guest here on the podcast, I hear about these different parenting strategies, and and it's really fun to hear. Um, I didn't grow up with that. My dad was MIA from the time I was eleven. Uh, um, and so, anyways, it, it's great to hear. And and congrats and props to you for thank you really understanding how important that is for kids. I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. Yeah. It, yeah. If I wish, I really wish I could have understood how critical those first couple of years of imprinting and neural synapses and connections and all the type of stuff from an early perspective. I think when you have young kids, you're just trying to stay awake and, you know, <laughs> figure it out and yeah. breastfeeding and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But man, the, the way kids imprint from an early phase yep. is phenomenal. It's, it's really cool to see how you can actually affect them you yeah. know, growing up as a kid. So my favorite memory of my dad, like, like even to this day, if I close my eyes, I have two major memories of my dad and, you know, not finite moment memories, but like concepts of my dad. And one of them was laying on his chest at night mm -hmm. in bed when he read popular science or national geographic or whatever magazine he was reading. And I would come curl up with him and I put my head right on his chest right here. And I could hear, I could feel the vibrations of him talking and breathing. 
And that was my safe spot. Like we wow. would talk about whatever we talk about school, girls, sports, you know, life, God, you know, whatever religion. Yeah. But just the, the breathing connection of him talking and the vibrations of his bass voice in my eardrum laying on his chest is my favorite memory. That's awesome. And the only other number one behind that is every year, right before school would start, he would give us uh, a father's blessing mm -hmm. and would stand behind us. And before he would just give us the father's blessing, he would give us a little shoulder massage and stand behind us and just kind of rub our shoulders. And the moments, um, the moments when I feel most connected to him or that I am really searching for him, I can feel his hands on my shoulders Wow! at times. There's moments in life when I can still feel him standing behind me with his hands on my shoulders. Yeah. I mean, that's a hugely personal, yeah. you can tell you're, you're emotional. That's a hugely yeah. personal event. I mean, um, those that are in the LDS Mormon church, a father's blessing is something where they, it's a prayer. They're praying sure. over you. And, um, you know, anytime I've been around it, it's, it's hugely, uh, reverent and there's a lot of thought and meaning and, yeah. and emotion that goes into it Yeah, because you, the purpose is to help this person and, and express your love. And that's probably why it feels so special to you because yeah. really what it is, is him expressing how much he loves you. And, um, you know, I felt that at times as well. And, yeah. And I served a Mormon mission. Sure. And what I realized on my mission was um, people respond to love. And as a parent, that's really important if you can sure. express. And that's what he was doing when, when he was giving yeah. that blessing. He was, yeah. he was expressing his love for you. And, yeah. and that's awesome. So Creighton, take us back to, you have a pretty interesting story. I read it on a text because I asked you, you know, what's something yeah. that can help our listeners that would be touching that yeah, sure. you've been through, you've had to overcome. And you said, my dad, uh, the house got broken into. He got beat, yeah. beaten within an inch of his life. Yeah. And then a few, a few years later, he took his own life. Yeah. And I have family members and, and friends who have dealt with family members committing suicide. And sure. it's really freaking hard. Yeah. It is so hard. And so I don't know where to start, but tell me a little bit about that and how that's affected you. Yeah. Um, so my dad committed suicide when I was 23. Wow. And... Um, had no safety net, had no life insurance plan, had no, you know, business to inherit and had to do everything on my own from there. Wow. So, and at 23, um, you know, you grow up, you, people say you grow up when you're 18 or, but you know, you move, yeah. move out maybe when you're 18. Um, no, no, 20, it was wild. I mean, college was fun. I told you I skied a lot in college and, you know, had fun. I was involved in the fraternity system. And I did okay in college. The year after my dad died, I was a 4.0 student. I put my head on straight and I focused on what was really important. Yeah. That's yeah, a life-changing changing experience. Life I mean, I still rely on my dad for advice all the time. Yeah. Uh, we weren't super close when I was growing up, yeah. but we've made up for lost time now and, and I'm thankful for that. And, um, you know, I'm th turning 39 sure. in a month Yeah, and I still call my dad for questions. Yeah. And so- so um, I. the girl I'm dating, Betty Jo, um, lost her mom about that same time sure. to cancer. And she'll cry randomly. She'll say, man, I miss my mom. Yeah. And it's tough. So um, just, yeah, tell me a little bit about the story. And really, obviously it's hard, but how did you kind of overcome the sadness, the grief, and what positive, um, if anything, did you pull from that? Sure. Forgiveness. There's a lot of anger with no, for him or no. yourself or yeah, yeah, myself. Wow, I thought it was my fault. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, that's got to be tough. Yeah, I thought it was my fault for a long time. Wow. Yeah, we. Um, I was a teenager. He died in 2003. Um, I was a teenager, and our house got broken into in 1997 and for a couple of reasons, I thought it was my fault that he was home because uh, we had gotten in a fight a couple of days before we were up in the mountains hiking and we were on this precipice and I was on ballet and I was climbing for rock climbers mm -hmm. and I was working on a crux move that I couldn't quite get over. And he was trying to tell, tell me how to do it, you know, and like, do this, put your hand here and do this and blah, blah. 
And I was like panicking and freaking out and kind of, you know, getting into like analysis paralysis mode type of thing. Like we get to in life a lot of times. Yeah. And he's up there on top of the rock expert climber world right now. I mean, last name low, like it's, it's up there. Oh, and he's on the rock trying to tell me what to do. And I'm freaking out and panicking down below. And I'm like, dad, shut the fuck up. You know? <laughs> Jeez. And he snapped. He's like, you ungrateful little shit and blah, blah. And he's like, yeah. yanked me up, tied me off, walked down, got in a fight with my mom, ran, didn't run, but got in a fight with my mom, walked down the street and hitchhiked home. Wow. Hopped on a plane, flew home. I was like, I'm done. Sheesh. And the next day our house got broken into and they beat the living shit out of him and left him for a, left him in a pool of blood. Wow. And he believes they had every intention of killing him once they found what they were looking for. And he was able to crawl out the back of the house. I think that he was carried out on angel's wings, to be wow. very honest with you. Um, but I remember when we got the phone call, we were at our Barrel Lake cabin and the phone rang at like 2 a.m. And I picked it up and it was my dad. My dad says, Creighton, I need to talk to your mother. And I hand the phone to my mom and I watched my mom in her blue nightgown just crumble, you know. Oh my gosh, are you okay? Hospital, credit card, cancel this. Yeah. You know, and as a like, 15, 16 year old kid, like immediately I thought, that's my fault. Yeah. Like I should have been there to protect him. I could have, I could have beat those burglars up. I could have, you know, I was a baseball player. I, if I would have my baseball bat, I could have beat him up or I could have, yeah. you know, protected my mom or whatever. And, and I carried, I carried that burden for about 10 years quietly. Wow. Yeah. That's tough. You know, a scene of Lion King? Yeah. That's really tough. Yeah. Yeah. I carried that. You know, Simba, run away. Yeah. You know, run away, Simba, and never return. Sheesh. That's tough. Yeah. The, the best advice I ever got from my business coach, I carried, carried a lot of guilt after my divorce. Um, just sadness for, for my ex, for my kids, um, for my own life. Just, you know, it was really sad. Uh, um, and my business coach said, you need to give your permit yourself permission and, and forgiveness permission to just let go of the past. Yeah. You did the best you could with what you had. Um, and I did, I worked my ass off to have a great marriage and, and, and be a great dad. And, and yet things don't always work sure. out. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, and that's the best advice I ever got from my business coach. He said, you need to give yourself permission. It's actually been on the podcast. Um, he'll be on the podcast, but, um, Said, give yourself permission, give yourself forgiveness, permission to let go of the past. We're so hard on ourselves. Yeah. We're so hard on ourselves. So you carried that self ridiculous. for 10 years. Yeah. And what helped you get over that? Um, some therapy. Um, I told you I was engaged. Um, and part of why I didn't go forward with that engagement was because I was stuck emotionally with feeling good enough to be a father figure and that kind of stuff and get wow. married and commit to marriage because- I just didn't know about that, but, um, I vividly remember when my dad did pass away. Um, I mentioned at one point during our interview and during our conversation today about, um, I can feel his hands on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And I remember the night that I got the phone call, um, from my cousin Alex mm -hmm. and he said, "Crate, you need to come home. And we were planning on going out to, a it was fraternity week and it was rush week up at university of Utah. So this is a few years after he had been beaten up. He, he, my dad, yeah. My dad committed suicide when I was 23. Okay. But really he was murdered when I was 17. And he's such a strong son of a bitch. It took him 10 years to die. Wow. He ended up taking his own life. He pulled the trigger, shot his brains out in the backyard, overlooking our you know backyard Jeez. on his birthday. And, uh, and that's a whole nother story of the timing of things and, the storms of life and heal them in 512. And if you're grounded and, you know, on the, on the foundation of our savior and the rock, um, the fiery winds and the darts of hell shall not come against you and go into whole depth of what that was like. But yeah, um, I'm a big believer of uh, God, higher power, however you want to call it, has a way of not just being there for you when things go wrong, mm -hmm. but if you actually look, he has been there for you all along. So that when things don't go wrong, he's there to catch you. Yeah. You know, that sand, that, that um, poem about footprints in the sand, yeah. right. You know, my dad's favorite. You think about that. It's like, there's only one set of footprints during the hardest times of life. Mm -hmm. You left me alone, you know? Yeah. It's like, 
It's like, no, I was actually carrying you. Yeah, that's when I carried you. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's when I carried you. Yeah. And as a father now, like I think about that. If my son, I yelled at my son yesterday. Yeah. I told him to shut up. Seven-year-old. Seven-year-old. My wife had a brunch in, at our house with some ladies, some girlfriends of hers. So it was my duty to go take the kids out of the house for a little bit. I took them to breakfast at Chick's Cafe in Heber. We went to the park, but then we got rained out. And then I drove up um, to a neighborhood that I got a listing company up and to go check on. And I was trying to kind of drive around and distract them for another hour until it was time to go home. And my son was getting bored. My dad, I don't want to go home. And grandma's at the house and yeah. he knows grandma's there. Dad, I don't want to go home. They don't want to go see grandma. And I was on the phone with my sister who just called from New York and I'm trying to keep my kids happy. And I turned, I was like, Brooke, shut up. Yeah. Dude, my heart sunk, man. Got a different perspective. My heart when, sunk. Uh, I pulled over and I was like, Brooks, I'm so sorry. I should not have said shut up. That was not nice of me. Yeah. And I had to make immediate amends. I mean, if you can do one thing, if I, if I can do one thing in life over, mm -hmm. repair. Yeah. Quickly. Yep. Repair quickly. If you get, if you cut your finger and you can clean it out and wash it and get, you know, isoprobic alcohol and put a band on it quickly, you'll probably be okay. It'll yeah. heal it fine. If you let it fester and you, you know, I know it's fine. I'm not going to deal with it and leaves little, you know, piece of granular stuff in there. It's going to yeah. fester and it's going to scar and it'll eventually heal, but it'll leave some big wounds. They say kids are resilient and they are, but that doesn't mean that they don't. No, nah, man. Repair as quickly as you can. If you hurt yeah. somebody, you repair quickly and you take on it. That's why credit to my wife. She, she is so, she is so good about holding me accountable. That's yeah. awesome. Not just like, I'm sorry. Like state what you did own why it was wrong. And then you can apologize and apology that. without like recognizing what you did wrong and why and how it hurt mm -hmm. and what it meant to the other person means nothing. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That doesn't mean shit. That doesn't yeah. mean anything. Well, especially if you're trying to excuse yourself. Well, I only did it because of no. X, Y, and Z. No, shut the hell no, up. No. Stop saying why you did it. Just admit what you did was wrong Yeah, and how it affected people. I love that. And, and my girlfriend and I, uh, we live together now. Yeah. Been dating three years. Cool. Six kids together. Yeah. Brady Bunch, yeah. four or hers, two or mine. Um, there's a lot of chaos. Yeah, but and there's a lot of lost patience as yeah. well. And we're working really hard. I mean, we've got a 17 year old moody teenager, we've got a 12 year old who's a sweetheart, but it gets a little crazy sometimes. Yeah, two 10 year olds yeah. who are crazy all the time, but yeah. hilarious and about to hit puberty. Yeah, and then two six year olds turning seven. And so, um, yeah, I lose patience sometimes. Yeah. So does so does Betty. And apologizing without trying to explain away what you did is really hard. And what's so cool is if you do it correctly, you model to them how to take ownership yeah. and repair. Yep. You're not just apologizing. You're not just saying, I'm sorry. You're taking ownership of your actions. You're acknowledging need for correction yeah. and you're repairing. And yep. when you do it correctly, it is so empowering to you and that person. So Take me back to, you're in college. What did you go to college for? You went to the University of Utah? I went to the University of Utah for skiing. Skiing? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went to the, no, I mean, I grew up in Alaska and I had an opportunity to go to like Oregon, Oregon State. Uh, a lot of friends stayed in the, kind of the Northwest. And then I had an opportunity to go to BYU and to the University of Utah. And I pulled out an atlas mm -hmm. and I like mapped out mileage from like BYU to Alta Mm -hmm. And University of Utah to Alta, and it was like 17 minutes and like 36 minutes. Yeah, and that was a deciding factor of where <laughs> I went to college because right. I could get three classes knocked out in the morning, up by opening chairlift at nine, and then back down for afternoon classes and stack those on Tuesday, Thursdays, and then ski all day Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and ski most of the day Tuesday, Thursday, and still get a degree. Wow, so it was That's a lot awesome. of fun. But I went for I got my undergrad in communications, awesome from the University of Utah. But and you started real estate while you're in school. Yeah, I uh, I was 22, 21, 22, and um, was engaged uh, early in my career, uh, early in my life. Anyways, didn't end up getting married, but was engaged. And my uncle, who was a real estate developer, had a project that he was selling. He was actually building some for lease, like Section 8 housing stuff in West Valley and West Jordan. And the city came to him and said, hey, we really like it if we could up our tax bases. Can you do some for sale property instead of some for rent apartments? And he said, yeah, I can convert the product, but I need to you know, pivot and build out a sales team. And so he called me and my cousin and said, hey, do you guys, you guys want to sell some real estate? 
And I was like, yeah, sure, I need, I need some money because <laughs> yeah. I was engaged and thinking about getting married. And so just like that, we went and got a real estate license and started selling townhomes on uh, Redwood Road and 78 South, a little community called oh, wow. Compass Cove yeah. Development. Nice. And then we sold um, Renaissance on Redwood Road right across from the movie theaters, the old drive-in movie theaters on Redwood Road by the Cow Ranch. And then we sold Belamonte, which is out 56 West and uh, Bangator Highway. Um, and then from there, moved over to Belamonte. No, that was, that was Copper Copper Canyon, Copper View, something like that. And then Belamonte over here by Ikea mm-hmm. um, in, uh, in Draper. So I sold through college. And then after that, when I graduated college, I wanted to go in more into corporate world. I thought I was going to go marketing, PR, mm-hmm. sales director. So I joined MacArthur Homes. Mm-hmm. Dave, Ron, and Steve MacArthur uh, worked for them as their director of sales and marketing and grew a new home sales division for them nice. and then went corporate with Richmond American and DR Horton and was on with Ivory Homes for a little bit and Clark Ivory and Dave Zollinger and Chris Camber Lewis and Tolberts and those guys. Carried that through the recession, worked for a few years through the recession and, um, and then had a friend approach me uh, about some medical sales. Mm-hmm. and invited me to go. We were we were comparing paychecks, go through like, oh, three, four, five, six. He was doing medical sales and orthopedic trauma, and I was doing real estate. We would compare paychecks, you know? Yeah. And I remember when he broke 100,000 and I broke 100,000, when he broke his first, you know, 150 or 200, we were comparing paychecks. Yeah. And then the recession hit, and my paycheck went like that. His paycheck kept on going up. And so yeah. he recruited me to medical sales, and I did a little bit of orthopedic trauma sales in the hospital for a couple oh. of years. Um right before I met my wife and then met my wife. And I mean, if you think being a buyer's agent during COVID was busy, Mm -hmm. being an orthopedic sales trauma rep, 24 seven on call, two cars to dinner, split from a restaurant, leave the check with your wife. I got to go to the hospital because a motor vehicle accident just rolled in with a level three triage and we got to get pins and rods and plates and screws. And it was a wild life. Yeah. But I missed the intellect of the OR. It was really cool. It was a lot of fun. And you did that for how long? Like a year or two, maybe okay. three years. Yeah. Always kept my real estate license active. So I was doing small deals on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also, I wanted to get out of the model home. I remember sitting in the model home up here at Ivory Ridge Yeah. Um, during a bleak winter snowstorm in like 2010. Yeah. No chance of anybody coming to the model home that day. <laughs> and just like, what am I doing here? This is yeah so tough. Yeah. And just Those are not some tough years. That's when I got in the business. Oh, yeah. 2010. Great. So, you know, nothing else. It was like. If I would have known now, if I would have known then what I know now about prospecting, database, lead follow-up, and repeat clients, mm-hmm. I think it'd be a whole different world. Sure. But I did not understand. I thought selling model homes was just wait for somebody to walk in the door and then sell them a house. Yeah. But. That's how most model home agents treat it, I think. Yeah, most are, but n- not the good not ones. Not the I mean, good ones. Like if you take somebody like Janine Notley at Edge Homes, right, who works her database and calls her realtors and does lunch and learns and that kind of stuff. If I knew how to operate my business like she does or like a Steve Sifus or something like that at Ivory Homes, the world would be totally different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Actually treating it like a business. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's what Mike Ferry teaches you. And, and yeah. you got into that world, yeah. obviously. The Evans team and, yeah. and Gene Tanner. Yeah. Yeah. Which you just left this last year and all the respect sure. in the world to them. Absolutely. I know them very well. And yeah. fantastic individuals, yeah. fantastic business owners. Yeah. Um during that time in 2010 when I was selling real estate and doing medical sales, Dan Evans and I were roommates over oh, here okay. in South Jordan. We lived a friend called Brandon Perry. And I would watch him wake up every morning, hit the gym, and up and out the door at seven AM in a suit and tie to some kind of a podcast and off the door. Mm-hmm. So when I went and did my medical sales and wanted to get back into real estate, he was the first phone call I made because I knew his work ethic. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what you do or how much you do it, but I'd never been on the brokerage side of real estate. Right. I'd always been on new home construction. Right. So I was like, all right, I want to get into the brokerage side. I want to do real estate buyer sellers type of stuff. And I'd love to come join you guys. So that was the only interview I did. I didn't interview with Colo banker, Keller Williams. You know, I just said, Hey Dan, I want to work for you guys. And met his brother and said, what do I do? And, when to work for them and best decision I ever made. Cause you know, straight to the top from learning from yeah. some of the best in the business. Absolutely. So. They've been doing it at a very high level for a very long yeah. time. And, yeah. and I think what you said is, is interesting when you get into that Mike Ferry group, yeah. a lot of my investors are top Mike Ferry agents, a sure. lot of my friends sure, and they all do the same exact thing. It's not a secret. Yeah. They wake up early, go to the gym, 
They are in the office really early practicing their skills. They prospect, they cold call, they contact their past clients yeah. and they do that. And before noon, before 12 o'clock, they've done more in a day than most people will do in an entire work work day. Yeah. Or week or, or work week. week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 For real. Yeah, or it's work week or work month. Huge amount yeah. of discipline. And, and I remember going to my first Mike Ferry trainings, being extremely uh, motivated and, and inspired by Matt and Dan, by Gene yeah. Tanner, yeah. by Hal Swayze, Ed Kaminsky, yeah. Michael Young, uh, Neil Weichel, all yeah. these people that were, that's all they did. It, it wasn't, it wasn't super complicated, but it's not easy to be that disciplined. Sure. It, it's a lot of work, yeah. but um, you've made a switch from Matt and Dan Evans and and Gene Tanner, sure. working with them for years, learning a ton. Um, again, amazing business owners and, and realtors. Yeah. You are really happy about the switch you made. And Very I was happy. reading actually your post about you interviewed quite a few different brokerages. Yeah. And the brokerage you're with now, um, they said, hey, what can we do for you? And, and what did your wife want? Yeah. And yeah. that seemed to hit really magic for you. And so what's changed from being on a team with the Evans, what has really been fun and exciting? And because and you've had your best year ever last year, right? Yeah. Fun, exciting, scary, emotional, yeah. you know, yeah. all of the above. Um, the, uh, the interview with Bridget Osgathorpe was mind opening because I sat down with, you know, I sat down with all the brokers and I decided, okay, if we're, if we're separating our businesses, then I want to understand the landscape and I really want to understand each individual brokerage's value proposition for two reasons. One, because I want to align myself with the value proposition that works for my business model. Mm -hmm. Two, I want to know how to cross sell against these guys based on whoever I choose. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like I went in depth with George Morris and John Sight. I went in depth with Kevin Cameron, rest in peace over at Berkshire Hathaway. And I went mm -hmm. in depth with Emily Lowry and Matt Brown at Keller Williams. And I went in depth with, you know, a lot of these um, other brokers. Um, I knew I not, I knew I wanted a full service brokerage. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a flat fee or a, a nominal brokerage. Yep. I wanted a brand because coming from where I was at, even though, um, you know, Summit Realty and the Evans team is technically a, a, a boutique brokerage, very high performing, but they've got a really well built out system that I was part of. And good reputation. Huge reputation and a really well built out system. I mean, mm -hmm. great transaction coordinators, great in-house staff, great everything at your discretion. And I knew I didn't want to go to nothing and have to build all of that. So I yeah. knew I wanted a, a ship that I could get into. I wanted a car that I could sit down in the driver's seat, hit the gas pedal, and it was going to work. Yep. Right. Um, so sitting down with all the other offices, they were telling me, we'll do this for you. We'll do this for you. Trust me. I'll do this. I'll do this. You'll get this. I promise you this. I blah, 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 blah. One interview was like an hour long. And I think I talked like two or three minutes. Oh no. And he just talked and talked and talked and talked, you know? And then I sat down with Bridget up at Park City and she said, tell me about yourself. Where do you see yourself going? What are your goals and accomplishments? If you were to sell your house, where would you go next? <laughs> yeah. You know, the Mike very questions, right? Q and A. Yeah. And then she said, What does your wife want? And it stopped me in my tracks. Wow. It I mean, it just stopped in my tracks. And I said, She wants her husband back. And in in a lot of more ways than one. I mean, she wants her husband back time wise, because at that time I had been a buyer's agent high producing 50 plus 40 plus transactions wow. for the last couple of years. That's a lot of buyers for, for our listeners that don't <laughs> understand working buyers, you're showing homes, evenings, weekends, nights, weekends, Saturdays, and um, then you're offering 40, 50 transactions is a lot of buyers to close. It was a lot of fun. I mean, there's more right that out there, you know, yeah. there's other high producers, but that was a lot. Mm -hmm. And to do it during COVID when there were, you know, 10, 15, 20 multiple offers, if a property list at 10 a.m., you got to be in there by 11. You got to have your <laughs> offer submitted by 12. It insane for a while. Dude, I remember some nights like on the computer till 11, 30, 12 o'clock, hammering out last minute negotiations, yep. you know, non refundable yep. earnest money, you know, title to my car, like <laughs> deed to my house, you know, first no born, first born child, no yeah. appraisal condition, waive the earnest money, take yep. this, you know, I'll bend over backwards. Here's my 401k, proof of funds, yeah. get this just to try and get a transaction accepted. And I think I had like a 95% acceptance rate. Like if we were going to wow. offer on a house, my client was not going to lose, yeah. right? We were not going to just go throw paperwork at something like you're, if you want this, we're doing this, this, and this, and you're going to get it, but it's going to cost you to get it. And, right. um, 
it was burnout. It was burnout city. I'd come home exhausted. My kids knew it. My wife felt it. Yep. I got distracted mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and it just about cost me my marriage. And we're still in the repair mode from some of those, you know, days and long nights and long weekends. And so, you know, God bless my wife for putting up with that and yeah. for seeing what I want to accomplish now with more free time, ability control. I mean, I have a hard stop for this interview at four o'clock because my wife has a dinner tonight and I promised her I'd be home by, you know, four 30 to take care of the kids and be on babysitting duty. Cause that is important to me. That's awesome. So Um, Bridget sold you by asking you questions and really finding out what was important. She found out my why for, for our listeners. If you're in sales, stop talking, ask questions. Yeah. It's like, I've tried, I've trained, I've had teams, I've had agents under me and it's like, shut the hell up. Yeah. Shut and ask a question up. and then listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> listen yeah. and then ask a question based on their answer. Yeah. Stop talking about what you, what you want to talk about. My favorite um, coach, Steve Powers. Yeah. Um, he, his, his line that really hit home for me was subordinate your story, which means stop trying to tell your story. It's not important. Subordinate, like that's secondary to yeah. whatever your buyer, your client needs to say. And so ask them questions. Yeah. So anyways, Bridget asked you that question. You switched over. You're really happy. You've had one of your biggest years ever. Yeah, yeah. Why else do you love you know, the brokerage where you're at? And, and what's changed for you as far as how you do business, where you're getting clients? Sure. The, the refined luxury at Sotheby's is world-class. And, and how so? Because I, I am completely ignorant on that brokerage. I sell real estate. Yeah. I'm a real broker. I sell like one house a year right now. Yeah. Yeah. Real <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah. Spring's doing a great job. Jared Fields Spring. are doing awesome. I'm with Spring. Yeah. yeah. Great. Bring in Justin are awesome. Great people. present. Good team. I building. wanted to be around really good, happy, motivated, yeah. win win people. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I'm with Spring and Justin. Yeah. But, um, you know, I do multifamily. I, I buy apartment buildings. I sell one or two houses a year right sure. now. But I still wanted to be around that. And that's why I joined their team. Sure. To be around really good people who would lift me up. Yeah. Even if I'm only selling one house a year right yeah. now. Yeah. Anyways, tell me about what is the refined luxury experience? What is so good about your brokerage and where you're at? It's an advertising agency that sells real estate. Oh, wow. I love that. I mean, you go to our Sugar House office and you're welcome to come up anytime. We can do another podcast there if you want to. Yeah. Our Sugar House office, which is home base, um, I think we have 30, 40, 50 full-time staff members between in-house photography, in-house video, in-house editing, social media uploading, the collections magazine, Tiffany Fox, Michaela, John Johnson. There's an entire staff department dedicated just to making our listings look absolutely spectacular. I love that. Absolutely spectacular. And hold on, I'm going to pause you right here because you and I have a very similar story that I caught when you were talking to me. Um, I just had a listing I sold. It's the first, the only listing I've sold this year. I was calling expireds. Okay. You know, whenever I have free time, I want to sell real estate. You know, the multifamily is a little slow right now. And so I was calling expireds. This this lady answered. She sounded really unhappy and her house had just come off the market. And I'm like, well, why didn't it sell? She was like, I don't know. My realtor, I can never get a hold of my realtor. Mm. Um, And I looked at her listing. The photos were terrible. No staging. Any picture of like a camera, like a, like a, it was a like, mirror with a flash. It was, it was it. iPhone. It was iPhone <laughs> pictures. It was yeah. iPhone pictures. And yeah. I'm like looking at the comps and I'm like, this is a really sellable listing. It's like yeah. 450,000 in Clinton. And I was like, how did he not sell this? She's like, well, we got offers. And it was long story short. She was about to lose it to the bank. Yeah. Her realtor told her go file for bankruptcy. Cause that's your only option. And it's, and she was filing the next day. And I yeah. said, please wait. Yeah. I will sell this house in a week. Yeah. We'll do staging, professional photography. Yeah. yeah. Let me come over tonight. And she's like, okay, fine, come over. Her and her husband were just like, oh my gosh, we're going to file bankruptcy. We're going to get nothing. And they said, we're going to go buy an RV and live in an... I'm like, you're not going to buy an RV if you file bankruptcy. And they're like, oh shit. Yeah. You're right. Our credit will be ruined. Yeah. I said, give me a week. Let me put it up for sale. Let me do a bunch of open houses, professional this, that. We got multiple offers and sold it for 12000 above what the previous agent had been asking. And so the reason I love about agents where you're at and brokerages where you're at, marketing matters. Staging a home matters. Why is it? Why do agents that don't do professional marketing, don't do staging, why is it such a disservice to their clients? Because that's their first showing. Your online. first showing is now online. Mm-hmm. Your first three showings. Yeah. yeah. People you're... look at houses two or three times before they ever come look at it in person. Yeah. 
and they're going to look at it. This is interesting. One of the things I love about Sotheby's and Tiffany Fox. Typically, and this is the way I used to do it. We take photos of the house and we have an exterior photo. And then we have another exterior photo and then a front door and then a front living room. And then, you know, we walk through chronologically. Yeah. They've done a study and this is really interesting. Anybody is welcome to steal this little tip if you want to, if you're listening. Don't do your photos chronologically. Mm -hmm. Sell the sizzle. Yeah. I've said that for years. Sell the sizzle. Kitchen, pick, whatever's sexy in the house, put it first. Pick the five best pictures that's yeah. going to grab your attention. The average consumer will look at the cover photo for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. If they like the cover photo and kind of look at a location, cool exterior, you know, whatever, whatever it is, they'll open it up. Your second image, you have like a 10 second and then eight second and then five seconds, five seconds, five seconds. If they like those first five images, they're already wanting to go see the house. Yeah. And then they'll just go click, 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 click. And you've done it before. Yeah. 80, 80 photos. Everyone's got bedrooms. Everyone's got bathrooms. Yeah. What does the kitchen look like? What does yep. the master suite look yep. like? Or the primary suite look like? Yep. You, pick your you pick your five marquee photos and you sell the sizzle. Love it. And then after that, you can go chronologically and repeat. And the other component too is, I learned this from Sotheby's, you don't need to show an ugly part of the house. Like yeah. if there's an ugly part of the house or an unfinished basement or a garage or something that's not finished or doesn't look good, don't put it in the listing photos. Mm -hmm. You don't need to show every room. Don't take a picture of a bathroom where you can't get the angle without the camera being in the mirror or the flash and some guy leaning in. You know, yep. <laughs> yep. Just don't put it in there. Yeah. They'll see the bathroom when they get there. It's just like your podcast site. Like, what's the hook? Mm -hmm. Get somebody to listen and then they'll listen to the podcast. Yep. But if they don't have a hook, they're not going to listen to the 30 minutes. Yep. So give them something to nibble on and then sell the sizzle. As realtors, you really should understand marketing. And there's brokerages that absolutely don't. And then there's people like Sotheby's. And I feel like real, especially Spring Benson and Justin, they really understand that. Um, so I'm happy for you that that you really found a better place. And I've jumped around brokerages as well. Sure. I started at Mountain Land, which is which was really great. Then I went to, with George Morris and sure. those guys for a while. And then I got out of real estate for a while and started my multifamily company. And and it really matters um, for your clients and for your own production. And, sure. and you've said that you're doing a lot better now, not only financially, but time with your family, which the, is The work-life really balance has been the absolute game changer. Yeah. So if yeah. you have a brokerage that can help you with that rather than overload you, I mean, that's huge. That's yeah. really important. In-house marketing. They're doing a lot of my social media posts. I have a staff member that goes to some of my photos and attends them. They encourage us to go to some of the photos and leverage those relationships. And it's one more contact point with the sellers. Yep. They're all there. In-house transaction management that's paid for. Danielle Carlson is incredible. Got a great service staff there. We have agent concierge. So if I ever need anything in the brokerage, I don't have to go to my TC. She does her job. I call it on my agent concierge and she will figure it out for me and take wow. care of that. I, I mean, it's, that. it's really, it's, it's a fine dining white linen table. I'd like my steak rare, medium rare with a side of au jus. And this, it's expensive. Yeah. It's probably the highest split of any brokerage out there. Wow. Right. But it is worth absolutely every penny, A, for the value it provides, and B, for the value then I can provide to my client, which has gotten me more business. I love so it. So even though I'm paying a higher split and paying, you know, a, a healthy split, I am getting other business that I likely may or may not have been able to without this massive support system behind me. And to be able to walk up to a listing and sit down and say, this is what you're going to get from me. Mm -hmm. And this is what you're going to get from my company that's here in town. And this is what you're going to get from Sotheby's International Realty to have those three circles to identify you get Creighton Low and his hustle and his creative marketing. You get Summit International Realty, which is here in town with Thomas Wright's leaderships and involvement in politics and connections to everything NAR and Adam Kirkham, who's, you know, Utah Association of Realtors president. Mm -hmm. They're my teammates. That's We're awesome. in this together. And then you get Sotheby's, which is the white glove service of all things expensive out of New York. Yep. It's really a trifecta that's unbeatable. That's huge. That's huge. And it's funny because I was raised in my real estate career by a broker early on that none of that mattered. Yeah. Um, and it was funny. She actually was intimidated. She wouldn't sell anything over back then. 350,000. She's like, people with money are, they're hard to deal with. And it's like, well, you don't have any services. You have no idea how to service those people. And, and so when I grew up in my career, I was like, you know what? I went from zero services and just don't answer your phone on nights and weekends, treat your buyers and sellers this way mm. to 
now I've learned like, oh, as I interview top agents like you and Ed Kaminsky and sure, you know, Ed luxury to, you know, yeah, like to, yeah, he's a name in luxury that is, is national. David Armenia. Yeah. 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 Um, they, they are just like, you know, Sotheby's and what you guys do, white glove service concierge, sure. the Nordstrom service. Yeah. So that's what I've started to try to model my business off my multifamily business off. how can i be more of a nordstrom type experience <laughs> yeah. you know where they take back returns stuff they didn't even sell people yeah, you know sure. like they did they're ser- so service oriented yeah. so that's huge and, and and i'm excited to see you grow and, and keep doing that i love your social media posts the dishwasher electrical posts i mean that's <laughs> that's interesting stuff yeah. you know like um if your dishwasher isn't working check this but there's lots of cool stuff we can do as realtors um what is I guess what would be something that you say would set yourself apart that your clients really appreciate? Because everyone does good marketing, everyone does this and this. Not and everybody, this. But, <laughs> but well, all the everybody top says agents, everybody says they do. Everyone yeah. says they do. So, so yeah. what's your like two or three? Really, this sets great and low apart. Yeah, um, there's a couple key talking points that I like to bring up in my listing presentation. Um, number one, I'm not a paint and carpet realtor. Okay. There's a lot of realtors walking in. This pretty, so pretty, and this look at this color, and this paint's amazing. It's carbon. Like I have, I joke that I have X-ray vision that I can see right behind those walls because I've bloodied my knuckles on dozens of remodels, and I'm a DIY guy. Home Depot is my go-to on Saturday morning. Yeah. So like literally, I mean, we're sitting inside a room, but I don't know exactly what is framed behind here. The guts of the house up here, where the HVAC is, the electrical, what's under the subfloor, what's behind the house, how the foundation was built. I've my new construction background, selling over a thousand or more homes during my new construction career. I've watched them be built from the ground up. Mm-hmm. So I really actually know the product that I'm selling really well, and I'll catch things that the inspectors missed mm-hmm. on the castle house, for example. Like you know, I get an inspection report, and they're like. We need, you know, two new water heaters. They aren't working. It's a vacation house. They have them on vacation mode. Yeah. Turn the dial and hit the <laughs> flicker. And I took a video and sent it to the realtor. And she's like, oh, yeah, okay, good. They work. Nice. Like they were replaced in 2021. They're on yeah. vacation mode. Like just hit the pilot light. So there's small things that I think really set me apart that I'm not just a paint and carpet realtor. Knowledge and experience. If you want to go with those two words. Yeah. That'd that's, be great. That's attention to detail. Yeah. I, I think that's really important. Um, if I have a fault that's not the Mike Ferry system is that I get really involved in a lot of the transactions and that's something I'm working on with my broker is to delegate more. Mm-hmm. Um, the castle house, I spent like two weeks physically cleaning that house out myself because my clients live in St. George. Mm-hmm. He's 85 years old. His 80 year old wife slipped and broke her back. She's uh-huh. had multiple surgeries, has a wound care clinic that she can't leave and they can't make it up here and they have no friends and family up here. They wanted top dollar. I felt like I needed to deliver it. And the only way to get that top dollar was to de-stage the house. We had to yeah. declutter the house. TVs. <laughs> I think it was like 13, but 18 sounds even better than 13. Yeah. But I physically was like, I said, will you please give me permission to take this 65 inch TV off the wall? Yeah. I mean, it's like a $3,000 TV with this mounting bracket arm, but it's sitting on top of this like gorgeous, quaint fireplace in this cottage chateau that leads towards a bourbon and a good book, yeah, not Netflix, yeah, right, and yeah. a big black TV. So we took all that out, and when he bought it, it had been on the market for like 180 days, and we negotiated down a couple hundred thousand dollars, and we put it on the market now, and it had multiple offers when the first week wow. above asking price at 1.2. That's awesome, which is great. And That's the only awesome. thing we're dealing with now is a dishwasher connection that needed to get done. That's awesome. Well. And for our listeners, and I actually don't know if you know this, but um, realtors have a worse reputation than car mechanics and lawyers. Mm. And I think that's exactly what it is. A lot of realtors, and actually they're really um, struggling now. There's a lot of realtors that just want to throw a house on the market. The market was so hot for so long. A lot of realtors, I started in 2010, which is really tough. Nobody had equity then. Nobody could sell. People were underwater and it was so tough and you had to go to extra effort, just like you're talking about, to get home sold. And then it got crazy hot for a lot of years and you didn't have to do a whole lot. And now we're back into a very tricky market. It's it's a lot better than it was last year, but it's very tricky. So for our listeners, if you're looking into getting into real estate or you're interviewing agents, um, go with someone that goes the extra mile, that's experienced, that really understands 
it's not about just throwing a house on the on online and getting some pictures taken with iPhone pictures taken. There's a lot more you yeah. can do and it matters. Yeah, it matters a lot. And now that I've been in the business as long as I have, I can confidently go into a seller and say it what I do matter. Yeah. It will make you more money. Yeah. The the couple that was gonna go bankrupt, they ended up walking away with ten grand in their pocket. Easy peasy. And they cried. They cried yeah. at the closing table. Yeah. Because they went from bankruptcy to 10K in their pocket yeah. from their realtor telling them file bankruptcy to me begging them not to and putting yeah. 10K in their pocket. Especially so, with everything going on right now with the NIR settlement. That NIR settlement is all about value. Yeah. It's all about what value are you bringing to the table? And you have to prove that value up front now, yep. which is awesome. I love it. You have to prove your value to your consumer to have them choose you to hire you. Why are you worth a commission? Yeah. What, is, what is your value? My value derivative is this. I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this. Yep. And you tell them that up front, right? Yep. Buyer, I'm going to I'm gonna search off-market properties. I'm going to find you know pre-market stuff. I'm going to decide for sale by owner. If you take a picture of a house that you're driving by and give me the address, I'll go knock the door and ask them if they want to sell their house and broker a deal off-market. I've done yep. it. Yeah. I've literally had a buyer take a picture of a home that says, if this home were for sale, I would buy this today. Yeah. And I took the address and I went up and presented myself to the sellers in a very nice manner. And it happened over the course of about six months, but they sold directly to us off market to my client who had taken a picture and said, if they're selling, I'm buying. That's awesome. And we bought it That's awesome. and it worked out fantastic. Yeah. Door knock. You just, you got to do a lot of things to really prove your value. And then half of the decisions, not half, but another big component of bringing value is be comfortable telling your clients why not to buy a house or be comfortable telling your clients not to sell or don't accept this offer and be yeah. confident. You know, I've had offers come in here and I'm the one you most say just like, no, go ahead and take it. First offer is the best offer. Sometimes you got to have confidence to say, no, we can hold out for this Yeah, and know that you're going to get it because of your marketing plan that we're doing it. So that works out really well. I love it. I love it. In every podcast, I try to take away some good nuggets, you know, and, and mm. what is, what am I going to focus on? Well, first of all, um, being a dad and, and the perspective you have after losing your own dad. Yeah is I'm assuming hugely different than it would have been because that's a life lesson. That's a really hard thing to go through. And then apologizing without explaining and and really um, being willing to admit what you did was wrong. Yeah, taking ownership of your mistake. And understand how it affected the other person. Yeah, taking ownership of your mistakes is a big one. That's awesome. You have to take ownership before you can repair. And, and then forgiving yourself. So I, I think that's, um, you, you know, even in a suicide situation where you, it wasn't your fault, obviously it wasn't your fault, no. but, but you thought it was, even if you didn't think it was your fault, there are regrets. You know, I, I have a family member whose um, sister, it, she's not a family member, she's a cl very, very close friend whose sister committed suicide. Mm. And um, she's like, well, if I had, if I just done this, if I just done this, no. it's like, no how could you have known? No, like we all went through those. My mom, actually, my mom still goes through that. You know, what if, or what I could have done. Yeah. We saw her the day before she, and she seemed happy and great. And I was just like, Oh, just my friend's little sister being a goofball. And, and the next day she's dead. Yeah. And she's like, well, what if I could have done this? I should have done this. And it's like, no, like you got to forgive yourself. You got to give yourself permission to let go. Yeah. Otherwise for 10 years, you said it affected you in a really, yeah dark way yeah yeah it was simba and and mufasa all over yeah. again down in the gorge and you know scar comes along and says you know it's run your away. fault run yeah. away yeah and i ran away and i'm learning in my 40s just now to not run away that's awesome turn and face and take ownership of your shit and deal with it i love that yeah well and i hope our listeners can can really understand that there's everyone makes mistakes even if you do make some big mistakes in life. You know, our, we had that gal on last week who addicted to meth at 12. She did some really bad things sure. through her teens. And she's like, I just, I had to forgive myself. Yeah. I had to, otherwise I'm not going to be a happy person. Yeah. And, and I really appreciate this, um, this episode and our podcast is about um, leveraging, leveraging your experience in, in life you've leveraged a very negative experience to become a much better father. And I can tell, you know, you're waking up, you want your kids to be happy and, and see a happy smile. That was a really cool thing you said. The first, the first three minutes before they wake up, three minutes. the last three minutes before they go to bed. The last three minutes, yeah. you're hugging them, kissing them, telling them stories. And um, 
there there's good parents and then there's I think there's exceptional parents who really understand you're forming this little kid's psyche. Like it is literally up to you to do a good job forming their psyche, their self confidence. Yeah. We do affirmations on the way to the school every day that I take. Do you remember school. do you remember David Stoko? Mm-hmm. Do you remember him? Yeah. Did you go to his funeral? I did not. It was one of the coolest experiences of my life. Coolest experience of my life. Yeah. His little son got up there and gave a talk about he celebrated his dad. Yeah. And it, for those listeners that were there, ran life. He's a local real estate agent here in town. Did a great job. He was murdered at yeah. one of his, at his rental, rental properties. Yeah. Went to go be a good landlord and deal with his tenants on some back due rent and walked into it what he did not know was going to be a violent situation and was shot. Mm-hmm. Terrible loss to our community because of an amazing man. His son stood up and gave a talk that I'll never forget because at the end of it, he talked all about his dad, but at the end of it, he said something and the chapel was full from the pulpit back through the overflow to the gymnasium to the stage. I mean, there was over a thousand people there. And he says, over the pulpit, he says, who are we? And the front rows were like, I am a champion. Who am I? I am a champion in the next 10 rows. Who am I? And the kid says, who am I? And by the time fifth or sixth time the kid says that, the entire gymnasium, I am a champion. Wow. And David Stoko grew up. That was his ninth mantra with his kids. He would ask his kids, who am I? I'm a champion. And they would repeat and affirm every night. And to sit there in that gym, in that funeral, his son, who am I? And the first front row, they knew it. They knew that was David. Yeah. I'm a champion. And then the second row caught on, and then the 10th row, and then the entire Fourier. And that 10 year old kid giving his eulogy for his father who was murdered at gunpoint at a listing, at a rental property. Yeah. Who am I? I am a champion. And David Stoko is an amazing example of that, of someone who is a champion and taught his kids how to be a champion. I love that. Yeah. That's huge. Well, we have to respect your wife and her cool. dinner appointment. <laughs> yes, that's good. We're seven minutes over time. I hope cool. you drive quick, but no, don't you're get great. a ticket. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. And we'll add all your links. Um, I sell real estate. Um, I love promoting good realtors. Oh, cool. I've never gone against you that I remember. but um, Probably I not because I was to. never a listing agent for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, now I'm listing in a different metro. But so if you're good. considering selling or buying a house, Creighton Low, uh, exceptional service. Thank you. Congrats on being a kick-ass dad. Thank you. Uh, good luck getting home in time to get your wife off to dinner. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate you.